here we go again. I am reading four more of the most hyped up romance books. First and foremost, I am reading Emily Henry's new release, Funny Story, because duh. This is my most anticipated release of 2024. I am so giddy and nervous and happy and trembling with anticipation. Love Theoretically by Allie Hazelwood. While I was researching for my other video, reading three of the most hyped up romance books. Quick plug, go check that out if you haven't already. This one kept popping up alongside a love hypothesis. Since I really enjoyed Hazelwood's writing, I thought why not read her other fan favorite. Flawless by Elsie Silver. I just binged the show Yellowstone and fell in love with Cowboys Casey. If you know, you know. So let's see what Chestnut Springs is all about. Lastly, Binding 13 by Chloe Walsh. This book lives on my Instagram Explore page and I've been itching to see what the big deal is. So let's start reading. <laughs> it's finally here. Okay, first, look at how pretty. Look at how pretty. Look at this pink. <laughs> Missed Emily Henry so much. I mean, y'all, I love that he's in Crocs. Honestly, I'm already, I, I'm with this cover, I'm getting Nick Miller vibes. In the roommate vibe, I literally can't wait for his proximity. So far, Emily Henry never misses, so, Let's see, I'm gonna start reading it right now. Why am I nervous? Why am I, I'm like nervous, excited. This cover and the Happy Place cover. Chef's freaking kiss. It's been so gloomy here and I hate it. I'm not gonna dive deep into the premise because I feel like everybody knows what this book is about, but this book follows our two leads, Daphne and Miles. They were both left by their respective partners, Petra and Peter, who were childhood best friends, who have now realized that they love each other. And then Daphne gets kicked out of her house and has to move in with Miles so that Petra can move in with Peter. Despite this double heartbreak scenario, Scenario. Daphne and Miles, of course, blur the lines of their new roommate dynamic when they start acting like a couple to get back at their ex-partners. And so, of course, Emily Henry uses her rom-com writing skills to weave these two abandoned loves into their own love tale. So, first impression, Emily on page 157. I am really, really liking it. You know, it starts off with these two people that are so heartbroken. I mean, Daphne was engaged and, and Petra was Miles' live-in girlfriend. So, you'd think like it would have this like melancholy tone to it, but the romance writing genius, Emily Henry continues to prove that she can make anything funny and good. I'm actually laughing out loud. Miles and Daphne are so funny, y'all. Daphne is so far a great protagonist. I really like her, she's so funny. I think what makes it so, her so funny too is because she's so quick to write people off. And it, you know, Emily Henry dives into why she's like that. I just feel like Emily Henry is using that to create just some humor in the story. So even though Daphne is heartbroken, really she's in the anger phase, you know? And so in this anger phase, she's pretty much just telling, she's pretty much just like telling everyone off and is like, screw you, Peter, I've moved on and I'm with Miles. So I feel like rather than Emily Henry focusing on Daphne, our protagonist, grieving this relationship, she's using Daphne's anger phase as humor. And I just feel like the whole setup of this book is pretty much just that she, Daphne is so pissed off that her ex has already moved on, pissed off at her ex for doing what he did, that she's telling him, hey, I've moved on with your new girlfriend's ex. And y'all, Miles is just, first of all, he's so funny. He's sarcastic, he's hilarious, he actually has me laughing out loud. And But Miles honestly is, I wasn't expecting this, but he is just so kind and so open-hearted and he truly does just want to do the right thing all the time. So far, that's what I'm getting. Just an interesting character that I'm really enjoying. I just, I'm, I really like Miles. He's not the character I thought he was gonna be. For me, he feels 
very different from all of Emily Henry's other MMCs. I'm really enjoying this, so I'm gonna just quit talking so that I can just read this book because I've been dying to read it all day. Those are my thoughts. Those are my jumbled up crazy thoughts right now. <laughs> Emily Henry mentioned in an interview that this book starts off being the tortured poets department coded with elements of midnight towards the second half of the book. And y'all, I couldn't agree more. This book was everything I didn't know I needed. The Romance Queen did not disappoint. I was so excited yet so nervous because I was worried this was gonna be a letdown, especially because this was my most anticipated release of the year. So I realized I was putting a lot of weight on Emily Henry. No, she did not disappoint. And now I'm living in the aftermath of reading an Emily Henry book where I don't know how I'm gonna read any other book. You know, I have no desire to read any other book. <laughs> this is what Emily Henry does to me. Emily's character-driven narrative, clever humor, introspection, all the romance feels, that's all in this book, y'all. This book, y'all, made me feel so seen. This was such a personal experience for me, and at times I found it to be quite moving. In my opinion, and this is just me, Daphne, our FMC, is among the most relatable out of all of Emily Henry's FMCs. The romance certain, certainly played a part, but what really gave me the emotional depth that I love in Emily's works was Daphne's dread of abandonment, her parental difficulties, and her cynicism. I started tearing up while reading this book when I realized how much Daphne's abandonment issues have affected her life and her relationships. I don't know if I've ever related more to a FMC in general until Daphne. This hit on a personal level. <laughs> now Miles, our MMC. He is regarded as the popular and carefree spirit. Although when he lets his guard down, he reveals a much deeper side. He is incredibly understanding of the feelings of others around him and is so patient where it, he doesn't even seem real. He is an optimist through and through. I know I'm probably the minority here, but I love his Crocs obsession. <laughs> it was not cringy at all for me. And maybe that's because I had rose colored glasses when it came to Miles, <laughs> but he's 100% my fave MMC out of all of Emily Henry's. I'm sorry, Wynn, but you've been replaced. Both these MCs were so layered and filled with so much nuance. The, this is the best opposites attract story I have ever read. Okay, so there's a side character in here named Ashley, and I normally don't talk about side characters, but I feel like she needs to be. Her contributions to this narrative was so significant, y'all. She actually had me laughing out loud multiple times in this story. She included a finding family element that I adored. Her personal experiences gave the narrative depth as well. I cherish her exchange with Daphne and this relationship that they built in this book. Okay, now let's talk about this romance. Let's talk about this romance. I was kicking my feet, y'all. I was a teenager in love. I was swooning. I was in I was in this romance, okay? There was so much chemistry and tension between them. I felt like I could touch it with my fingers. And they were just too cute. Their connection offered so much more than sexual chemistry and even while the physical tension was incredible. It wasn't immediate love, which I enjoyed seeing play out. The angst, though, the angst. The angst was evident on almost every page. It was like radiating off of the pages. <laughs> now, they did first experience some trauma bonding, but I feel like with the premise of this book, that is very understandable. And I just feel like you, like everybody knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. But it's obvious that their chemistry was not a result of the hand that they were dealt, if that makes sense. I just love the direction Emily took this story in. I, I, Honestly, I, it just, it showed me that there was a lot of thought and intention when it came to these characters and how Emily Henry wanted this story to go. And even though this could have easily been your typical fake dating cliche, didn't feel like your fake dating trope rom-com. The fake dating did play a part in this, but it didn't take center stage. 
It wasn't the focus. It was just like an added little sweet bonus. Now there is that conflict towards the end, right? That you get in every contemporary romance. And a lot of people might feel differently about this. Since I could relate so much to Daphne, I don't want to spoil anything, but the way the conflict played out, I totally understood where Daphne was coming from. I personally believe that it was very realistic. See both sides of it and you understand both sides and you see how this could easily happen with both of their personalities. Her writing is obviously, in my opinion, consistently clever and lovely. And with this book, I found myself blushing, crying, kicking my feet and laughing. This satisfied all my needs, checked all my boxes. This book, was five whole stars. Five whole crisp, fat, juicy stars. This book and The Happy Happy Place are my now my top two books of Emily Henry. I know that might be a little controversial because I know Beach Read is a very, very common favorite, but in my opinion, it's third. Now I don't know what to do with my life, you know? Love theoretically. I only got to page like 103, so I did not read much, but this narrative centers around Elsie. It is from, it is told from her point of view. She is a theoretical physicist who works two jobs, one as a professor and the other as a fictitious girlfriend or a dating app. And she is struggling to make ends meet. Greg, a male, he's not our MMC, has been hiring her for the past few months to be her fake girl, to be his fake girlfriend. She meets Greg's older brother, Jack, our MMC. She finds him to be conceited and difficult to understand. Elsie is being interviewed for a position that she really wants and needs, but guess who's on the hiring board? Yes, it's Jack. You guessed right. And Jack is an experimental physicist. And Allie Hazelwood goes into the differences between a theoretical physicist and an experimental physicist. And she dumbs it down for us. I'm not gonna go into explaining it, but there's like a huge difference and clash and feud between those two types of physicists. Now my first impressions, I was hooked after the first chapter immediately. And honestly, that's one thing I'll give this book already over Love Hypothesis. Let me make something clear. I loved Love Hypothesis. I think I gave it 4.5 stars, I don't remember. I fell in love with Olive and Adam, they are my babies, I love them so much, and they made me fall in love with Allie Hazelwood's writing. But for me, Love Hypothesis didn't get good until like five chapters in. This book, I was hooked after the first chapter. Like Love hypothesis this is a stem science theme obviously but what i'm trying to say is it's like love hypothesis it's not too much or hard to understand i feel like ali hazelwood does a great job at making this stem world seem interesting i love both our mcs elsie and jack already this is definitely giving enemies to lovers trope i am very 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 excited to see where ali hazelwood is going to take this story since she truly surprised me with some of the story themes in Love Hypothesis. This one felt very similar to love hypothesis, big dude, girl thinking he hates her, girl not having any time for relationships, girl being so cute and quirky and small. But I think this is just Allie Hazelwood's thing and I just need to accept it if I'm gonna continue to read her books. What I didn't like, I felt the people pleaser theme was very over exaggerated. I just found it weird that she couldn't tell her best friend that her favorite movie was Twilight, but she could tell her client. That just made no sense to me. I don't know, I have, friends and family that are extreme people pleasers, but I just feel even they would agree that this was a bit overstressed. Nobody come for me, okay? I do feel like Allie Hazelwood described Jack as big way too many times. Like, we get it. Our boy is huge. I don't know how because he probably spends all his time in either a lab or an office, but okay, we'll pretend he goes to the gym six times a week, only eating chicken breasts and protein shakes. Olive and Adam from Love Hypothesis play a cameo in this, and it was honestly my favorite part of the book. It just showed me how much I loved Love Hypothesis. That is still my favorite of Allie Hazelwood, and it was honestly my favorite part of the book. It was just nice getting a little bit of Olive, and you kind of get a little update on their story as well. I had so much fun while reading this book. I love getting to know all these characters. 
I feel like Hazelwood added more depth and layers to her characters this time around that we didn't get in Love Hypothesis because one of my issues with Love Hypothesis was that I felt like I never really got to know Adam. That was not the case with this story. We got Jack's upbringings and his morals and we saw like how passionate he was but how he always put Elsie first and caring, patient, and gentle. And I, I loved him. I really loved Jack. It was great this time around to have more of a layered story, but still, still have fun. You know, Allie Hazelwood knows how to write a fun, cutesy romance. Um, I loved seeing Elsie's character development from extreme people pleaser to her own person. It was nice to see that play out and especially with Jack being a big part of that journey and just calling her out on her crap. I was definitely rooting for my Elsie girl throughout the book. Overall, Elsie and Jack were so cute. I had such a fun time. I think I used the word fun multiple times and that's very repetitive, let's just pretend I didn't. Um, I loved their dialogue, their hilarious banter and there was great chemistry. This was definitely enemies to lovers. Solid four stars. And I will be reading more of Ali. Hazelwood, but I'm just gonna accept that she's gonna describe her men as big and her girls are always gonna be quirky and never have been in a relationship before they meet our MMC big scientist dude. So it's funny because I just started Flawless. For some reason, I thought that the premise of the book was that our MMC Rhett was a dad and our FMC was a nanny and that was their meet cue. I soon come to realize that Rhett <laughs> does not have a child and I was like why did I think that because I didn't even read the premise of this book when I bought it and I realized that I saw the word babysitter written on the back and I formed my own assumptions based off of that small piece of information and when I was starting off the book when I was reading it like I was like four chapters in I was like wait but Rhett you're a dad like this isn't making sense I was like what is happening where is this going like where is your child and I soon realized that you know Rhett is not a dad. Anyways, you probably don't care, but it was just a funny experience for me, so I just wanted to share. And if you thought Rhett was a dad, he's not. <laughs> So Flawless is the first book in Elsie Silver's Chestnut Spring Contemporary Romance Series. This installment centers around Summer Hamilton. She is a public relations intern at her father's business who gets assigned to shadow a professional bull rider whose previous comment caused a great deal of controversy, whose name is Rhett. Isn't that name so cute? I just love it. Um, Summer seems like a prissy person so Rhett isn't too delighted that she's watching him all season. The more time the two spend together, the more their business connection starts to feel more personal, of course, right? And then it develops into romance and all that jazz. My first impression is so far this seems like it's very predictable. I always seem to kind of guess what's gonna happen next. Elsie Silver is using all of the more common tropes like enemies to lovers, one bed, forced proximity, but at the same time, despite all that, I'm having such a fun time. Um, even though I can predict what's gonna happen, I really like these characters, it's fun. It's, it's kind of like I'm just watching like a cheesy Hallmark movie, but I'm having a great time and I love the country vibes. Am I entering my cowboy era? We shall see, but with names like Rhett and Bo and Kate, I think I am. And the ranch is literally described like the Yellowstone ranch from the series. And so I'm just envisioning my boy Casey riding a horse. So I am enjoying this despite all the predictable tropes. Yeah, we'll see. I'm halfway through. I'm on page 191. It's a quick read. I'm devouring the book. I'm getting through it pretty quickly. Very, very easy, easy read and not complex characters at all. So it's a fun time, but there's, there's layers to these characters which there's actually more depth to them than I thought there was going to be. So I really like that Elsie Silver did that. That's all I think I'll have to say right now. I finished Flawless. Four stars. I'm entering my cowboy romance era. Let's all just admit that cowboys are hot. If you say otherwise, 
I think you're lying. I knew I was gonna love this because I have been wanting to read just a good cowboy romance ever since I binged the show Yellowstone and fell head over heels for Casey and Rip. Despite this being one of the most predictable romance books I have ever read, it kept me interested and I loved it anyways. I loved all the vibes. Elsie Silver was obviously very influ influenced with the Yellowstone setting when she illustrated a picture of Chestnut Springs. The imagery that Elsie was able to convey with her writing though was hands down breathtaking so I will give her that. I am a simp for Rhett Eaton. I love that his hair was long because I envisioned Casey. I know I have an obsession. He does have a sweet side and it is reserved for summer. Um, there wasn't much to his character. I mean I will say that I feel like his profession of being a bull rider was the main focus of his monologues. I do wish that we got a little bit more depth of Rhett um, but I feel like Elsie Silver, the author, like tried to tap into that when she would mention him, saying that he felt like his family was never there for him, his family never supported him, and that he's never felt any support until Summer. So at least we got that. It's not like he wasn't layered at all. Summer was lovable. I think she was a great FMC. I was honestly surprised to see that there were more layers to her than just being like the city girl that falls in love with the cowboy. I enjoyed her character a lot, actually. The way she was done so dirty in her life but still managed to turn out to be an optimist made me love her. I admired her strength. I really enjoyed the premise. I enjoy the concept of Rhett being a bit of like a troublesome bad boy who's gotten himself into some trouble which cost him his reputation and some sponsors and Summer who like comes in, keeps him in line. Like I thought the whole idea was creative and it definitely piqued my interest. Created the family dynamic in this book which I loved. I loved, I loved the Eaton family and then I even love Summer's best friend Willa. But I knew I didn't even have to look it up because I promise I didn't like I didn't know this beforehand but when she was describing Bo and Cade and Willa and Jasper and Theo I was like yeah there's gonna be books about all of them I guarantee that's what the other books are about in this Ch Chestnut Springs franchise I saw that the next book is about Kay which I think is you know gonna be grumpy sunshine because Willa seems to be you know fit into that mold and so it seems like that's gonna be the trope um, which I think is gonna be so cute because Willa was likable even with her small appearances in the book let me just say you know who I fell for Bo and I realized that I think this is an unpopular opinion because when I was looking at um, these books and even like fan art I'd see, everyone's obsessed with Kate. Something about Bo. Bo did it for me. So I was like, okay. I looked up to see where Bo's book falls in line in the series and his book is the last book. I was like, why did Elsie Silvers wait so long? Like that's the one I wanna read. So can I skip? I just wanna read Bo's book. He had me laughing out loud and I just know that there is more to that man. And the fact that he was just always the smartest one in the room, even though he like comes off, he's just having a good time and not really taking anything seriously. He just gives golden retriever energy. And <laughs> I do think that this book was at least 50 pages too long. I felt like it started to drag towards the end and I was like, okay, let's wrap this show up. This book was such a light, fluffy romance, not serious at all, but it was what I wanted at the time and I didn't even realize that I wanted something light uh, but I did so the timing was great I at first I thought it was a 3.5 like when I finished the book I was like 3.5 solid but then following day I realized that I could not stop thinking about Chestnut Springs or Rhett. My card was full. I had to switch it. I honestly lost my train of thought. I realized that I wanted more. And so I was like, yeah, I think this is a four star because uh, despite it being, you know, like I said, so predictable, a little cheesy, you know? Yeah, this is definitely a forgettable romance. I probably will forget this story in a month. I don't care because I had such a fun time. I really did. And so I will be reading the rest of the series, which is funny because when I finished the book, I thought, I don't know, how I'm gonna read the rest of this series because I don't know if I really liked that. And then like I said, I could have stopped thinking about it and I want more. Anyways, yeah, so I settled on four stars.
So now I'm finally reading Binding 13. I started it, I got on page 151. I don't even know where to start. Okay, first of all, I was putting off this book. I honestly thought about ending the video with Flawless. I thought, you know, three books is solid because I honestly just didn't want to read this. I don't know why, like I bought it because I really wanted to read it. And because it's like one of the most hyped up book talk books So for this video, but also because I truly, y'all, I wanted to read this book. But then when it got time to it, I kept pushing it off. And then I started reading the book. I was like, I just need to dive in. I just need to get past the first hundred pages. I'll get sucked into this world. But it's like been okay for me. It's been kind of mid. Honestly, it's it's interesting. Like it's it's holding my interest. I guess I just thought it was gonna hit more. I guess I just thought it was gonna be better. Like I said, I'm only on page 150. And this is a longer book, y'all. It's like 600 pages. And I kind of hate the how big this book is. Like it's so just big. I don't know. Why is it so big? I don't know. Maybe like it needs to be. I just hope it doesn't drag because I'm like, why does a romance need to be this long? Like what's wrong? So I heard, you know, that this gives off major like Wattpad writing. It does. It really does. I mean, just with the premise alone. So it's pretty simple. I mean, the story follows a girl that gets bullied at her old school. And so then she transfers to a more preppy private school. And then she meets the most popular guy who also happens to be the rugby like prodigy. And they fall in love, right, slowly, but they hide it because it's kind of forbidden because of how they met. This is gonna sound so funny when I say it out loud. <laughs> but pretty much, he hits her in the head with a rugby ball. She falls, she has a mild concussion. He helps her because of her history. Her mother freaks out because she thinks that she's getting bullied again. Like she, <laughs> she thinks that Johnny, our MMC, is bullying Shannon, our FMC. The mom is pretty much like, you need to stay away from my daughter Shannon and she even gets the principal to make sure Johnny stays away from Shannon. It has this sort of like forbidden vibe. I don't know, I honestly don't know how I feel. I, it's not bad. I'm not necessarily bored, but I'm not invested. You know, I'm not devouring the book. This is already feeling like a really, really, really slow burn because I'm on a page 150 and we haven't really gotten anywhere with their romance. You know, it's funny because you know my favorite parts of the books, it's actually interesting, my favorite parts of the book so far are when it's Gibsy and Claire. They make me laugh so hard. Gibsy is so funny to me. And I kind of have a crush on Gibsy, despite him being a walking red flag. And so I realized when I found out that he was number seven, I was like, oh my gosh, Taming Seven has to be about them, right? And so I looked it up and Taming Seven is about Gibsy and Claire. Gibsy is so funny. You know, I'm starting to realize my weakness is a funny guy, a guy that makes me laugh because I loved Bo in Flawless and now I love Gibsy. And I'm realizing I'm talking to you like you've read this book and you might not have read Binding 13. So, by and Gibsy is Johnny's best friend and then Claire is Shannon's best friend. Chloe Walsh's newest release is Taming Seven and Gibsy and Claire are the protagonists in that book. When I said Gibsy was number seven, it's his jersey number is number seven and then Johnny's is 13. Man, I'm doing terrible at explaining this because I was just, I was talking to you like you've read this book but you might not have read this book. This book is dual point of view so you're getting Shannon and Johnny's point of view which I love. I love dual point of view and both of the characters are likable and I am excited to see what direction this book is gonna go in. See, so far it's been kind of predictable as well because it is giving off that like Wattpad writing theme so I can kind of guess like what's gonna happen. I'm still liking it. Like I, I don't dislike the book so far but I don't understand the hype I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like this book is so raved about and I'm so far I'm thinking why. I hate Shannon's family. I really do. I hate her family except for her brother Joey. And then we haven't met Johnny's family. Actually, we haven't even met his parents now that I think about it. Most of Johnny's scenes are just like himself or with Gibsy.
Okay, I finally finished Binding 13. We have a lot to discuss. And honestly, this book is kind of hard for me to rate because I just finished it last night, so I feel like I'm still trying to grapple what I'm feeling. Okay, so honestly, until the last 100 pages, this was a solid three stars. But y'all, those last 100 pages, I am officially invested. I can't stop thinking about all of these characters. Shannon, Johnny, Joey, Gibbsy, Claire, they have shoved their way into my heart. I'm serious, I'm not even kidding when I say this or I'm not even trying to do this for dramatic effect. This is all 100% real. The last 100 pages, bumped this up to a 3.5. Kind of crazy. That's never happened to me while reading a book. The hold those last 100 pages have on me. Yeah, Chloe Walsh did that. First, despite this book being so Wattpad coded, Chloe Walsh captured character building and relationship building so well. Every little detail of each of these characters felt so intentional and I always appreciate that because that is what I'm always looking for in a novel. The, this plot was definitely character driven. Also, I wanna say this book was the tortured poets department so high school by Taylor Swift coded. I <laughs> was hearing that song in my head while reading this book. It, this book and that song match so well. I mean, touch me while your boys play Grand Theft Auto. I mean, if you know, you know. I'm getting sidetracked. Okay, so let's talk about the characters because that's what this book was mostly about. Okay, first our FMC Shannon. I wanted to hug Shannon so bad. I just wanted to embrace her while I was reading this whole book. I wanted to protect her, protect Shannon at all costs. Her monologues brought me literal chills and tears to my eyes. I hate her parents. So I didn't dive into this when I was talking about the premise of the book. So Shannon goes through a lot of horrible things. She, like I mentioned earlier, she was bullied at her old school. But not only that, she has to deal with an alcoholic, physical abusive father and a weak, stupid mother. Oh my gosh, her mom basically just turns her head to the physical and emotional abuse being inflicted on all of her children. But you know, despite it being infuriating, it made the plot so much more compelling. I can't explain to you how seething with anger when I would read about her parents. But I just wanna point out that Shannon's story is so much more than a girl that has been bullied, physically and emotionally abused and hurt repeatedly. This story, in my opinion, is about healing yourself, picking yourself up over and over when people continue to knock you down, even your family and learning to trust again. And that brings in Johnny, our MMC. That man, I, okay, I understand the hype. I do, I get it, I get it girls, I get it. He is the epitome of a protective, lovable love interest. Nobody protects like Johnny. What I love the most about him though is that he knows what he wants and he goes for it. But he like goes for it with his all. Honestly, like seeing, you know, the negative effects also of that all or nothing attitude towards life was hard to read at times and broke my heart and frustrated me a little bit, but it was so realistic. Truly y'all, you know, despite whatever I'm gonna say, I just wanna make it clear that I cherished watching Johnny and Shannon's romance develop. Chloe Walsh did a fantastic job of giving their characters genuine growth. Their relational development went at such a steady, realistic pace, especially when you know their characters. With the trauma that they've endured and just knowing what they've been through, seeing them come together and watching that relationship grow was so realistic and I'm in awe of how Chloe Walsh set such a steady pace in their relationship and truly she did a fantastic job with that and so I just want to make that clear. It did help me understand why this was a longer book, you know, not just 300 pages. Do you feel like it could have been a little bit shorter? I do feel like there were a few scenes that were pointless and it, it kind of just felt like filler and with this being so a 600 page book, we did not need the filler. It truly was a lovely narrative, even if there were a few extremely cringy and predictable parts, I still want more. And honestly, that's all thanks to the last 100 pages. <laughs> 
and the side characters. Let's talk about these side characters because honestly, in my opinion, they weren't side characters. They were so pivotal to the narrative of the story just as much as Johnny and Shannon were. First, we need to talk about Gibbsy. I mentioned him earlier, it's Johnny's best friend. Gibbsy is my boy, y'all. I have such a huge crush, I don't even care what that says about me. He made me laugh so hard. The way he made me laugh at the most impromptu time made my heart go whoa. Like, <laughs> I adore him. His love and support and loyalty to Johnny was beautiful, truly. Like, no matter what, he stuck by Johnny through thick and thin. He truly just was a great friend to him and I loved seeing their relationship and just their dialogue made Johnny's POV chapter so much more interesting. I mean, honestly, in my opinion, Gibbsy kind of carried this book on his shoulders because he made it so much better for me. Once he came into the book, I slowly became more invested because it was a little hard for me to get into in the beginning. Another character that made it really good for me was Joe. Joey. Joey is Shannon's brother, her older brother. I love him. He's, I think he's even in the first chapter and honestly, he, from the first chapter, he had my attention. Love Joey. I think about him though and I wanna cry because this boy deserves everything and more. He deserves so much better than what life has given him. Gosh, he was just, he is just such a good brother to Shannon. Oh, like he carried her. He got her through. Like without Joey, I don't know where Shannon would be, honestly. I have such a crush on Joey as well. I understand why Chloe Walsh wrote a book about him and his story. And then Claire, Claire is Shannon's best friend. I adore her. She is also such a loyal and supportive, great friend to Shannon. Every girl deserves a Claire. She definitely deserves way more credit than she gets. And I wanted more of her. And so I will definitely be reading Taming Seven, which is Gibbsy and Claire's story. I do wanna say that there is something about Walsh's writing style that I feel is not for everyone. Some parts are seriously cringy, y'all, and a little uncomfortable. It was hard for me to get through in the beginning, like I said, really, it was hard. And even by page 200, I wasn't invested. I was entertained, but I wasn't invested, but what I will say is I feel like Walsh's writing did help me connect with her characters and this world she created, which led me to becoming invested towards the end. That makes sense. I do also wanna mention, I was under the impression that this was YA. I thought this was just another YA sports romance. I understood that, you know, there was physical abuse and family drama that the FMC was experiencing. I don't think I would classify this as YA. I don't know, it's hard to explain because Chloe Walsh's writing style is YA, but some of the abuse scenes in this book had me as an adult drawing back and horror. They were a little hard to get through and very triggering. I think it deserves a trigger warning. So I just wanted to clarify that because I feel like a lot of people think that this is YA because that's what I thought. Overall, I did enjoy this story and it evoked emotions out of me that I did not know I could possess towards a book. I have never read a book where I'm shaking from anger, where I'm livid um, and infuriated for my characters. So that was new, but it also like, I it's rare when a book makes me laugh this hard. And I did cringe quite a bit. <laughs> like, you know, when you physically cringe and you kind of have to just like look away and <laughs> compose yourself and just power through. There were multiple moments like that. Some scenes, you know, kind of had me rolling my eyes because they were so unbelievably predictable. But then there were some parts where I'm like, I was vibrating with anxiety. Like I was so anxious about the way things were gonna unfold because, you know, I was becoming invested. And then like by the last, 20 pages, I wanted to throw the book. I was feeling so many emotions. So honestly, it's weird. I, I felt I was on a roller coaster of all these crazy emotions while reading this book. Would I recommend this book? Yeah, I think I would with a few warnings. You kind of got to know what you're going into with this one. And I, I hope that I did well at explaining that. I hope that I hope that you have more of an idea of what this book entails, you know, if you haven't read it yet. But yeah, I think I think you should give this a whirl, you know, if if after everything I've said you still want to read it. <laughs> yeah, I think you should. Personally, I do think it's a bit overhyped, but it you know, I don't regret reading it. I don't feel like I wasted my time and I love that I know these characters in this world. So, yeah, I'll be reading the next book. I'll be reading Keeping 13 and I will be reading Joey's story and Gibbsy's story for sure. 3.5 stars. Yeah, I'm invested.